Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we explore a retelling of Daniel Defoe's classic novel, Robinson Crusoe. We will travel across the cerulean seas, make a home on a deserted island, and find peace within ourselves against all odds. Before we begin our sleepy journey, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress underneath you. For a brief minute, just turn your attention to the here and now. Recognize how it feels to be lying in bed and relaxing. Feel the softness of the sheets that are encompassing you, the plushness of the mattress that is gently cradling your body and urging it closer and closer to a night of sleep and relaxation. How wonderful it is to simply be here right now, to have no obligations, nothing to do except embrace the comfort that your bed is offering you. Now, for a moment, try and imagine that your bed is not in your room at all. Instead, your bed is resting on the edge of a tropical beach. Even with your eyes closed, you can tell that's exactly where you are. You can smell the salty, briny, unmistakable aroma of the ocean. You can feel the breeze whisking off of the waves and brushing across your face. Somehow gentle and wild and soothing all at the same time. You can feel the rays of the sun kissing your skin as they beam down from the baby blue sky overhead. And you can hear the soundscape of this tropical island paradise. It's a sound unlike any other. The waves lapping up on the shore with their steady, reliable rhythm, lulling you closer and closer to sleep. The palm fronds swaying against one another, whispering as their evergreen leaves brush back and forth and back and forth. And then there's the hum of the island, the melody of tropical birds flitting from branch to branch, sending leaves cascading down onto the ground with every flap of their brightly colored wings the orchestral wonder that is their song, a gift passed down from generation to generation, so entwined with their being that they're able to sing it to the universe from their very birth. In your mind, you can see this island, the water, a mosaic of turquoise and cerulean and sky blue, the warm white sand glistening in the sunlight, the palm trees that arc over the water, casting dark, cool shadows over the tropical waves. It is a slice of paradise, a slice of paradise that you can visit absolutely any time you choose to. 
you sink deeper into your mattress and turn your attention to the sound of the waves. As you breathe in, you hear the waves coming to shore, bringing that beautiful turquoise water onto the sand. And as you exhale, you watch the water as it recedes back into the ocean, leaving trails of ocean foam and seashells in its wake. As you breathe in, you watch that water come to shore, bringing with it a sense of renewal and peace. And as you breathe out, you watch that water float back into the ocean, leaving your body refreshed. You can return to this steady rhythm any time you feel the need to return to the beach and find comfort in your body and mind. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the space that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. Robinson Crusoe never liked York very much. Although it was a cozy city of cobblestone streets, old libraries, and tiny bakeries tucked into ivy-coated alleyways, he never felt like he belonged there. It was a safe city, a city full of the comforts and the convenient aspects of modern society. But it was missing something, something that Crusoe craved from a very young age. When he was a child, Crusoe spent every moment he could down at the docks on the river. Some mornings, he would grab the bread and butter his mother set out for breakfast, and he would sprint out the door into the brisk, dewy air. He would race down the streets, tipping his hat and giving a wave to every person that he passed by. He was always practically buzzing with anticipation and excitement, his mind reeling as he wondered what magic the day would bring. And when he reached the docks, he would be faced with something new every time. Ships that came from distant lands to drop off goods from places he had never even heard of. Novelties, spices, and cloths that were beyond anything he could comprehend. Some days, he would sit by the river in awe and watch as sailors carried goods off of the boats. He would always try and steal a peek at what was inside their barrels and crates, but the sailors would urge him away with the shake of their hands. On occasion, however, the sailors would humor Robinson. They would pop open the strong wooden crates to show him the foods and spices and goods they had sourced from all over the globe. They would tell him tales of their adventures as he listened on, wide-eyed and enamored with the fantastic stories of daring deeds and heroism and magic. Robinson knew he didn't belong in this little city. He belonged out on the waves, out on the uncharted territory where there were things to be discovered 
by those brave enough to journey out and find them. He knew in his heart and felt in every fiber of his being that he was one of those people. And so, throughout his childhood, he went down to the docks any and every chance he got. As he got older, he actually got some of the sailors to talk to him and listen to him, to respect him. These conversations only made his love of sailing and adventure grow more and more. The sailors talked about tropical beaches, beaches so warm that you could lounge on them for hours, feasting on the many fruits that sprouted from the vibrant plants on the sand's edge. They talked about the colorful birds that dropped red and green and yellow feathers in their wake as they flew on to the bright horizons. It all sounded so beautiful that Crusoe swore he could smell the sand and the surf. He swore he could feel the sweet juices of the tropical fruits on his tongue. He could hear the birds calling out to him, urging him to relax and unwind on the sand. And so, Crusoe's mind was made up. He was to be a sailor, an adventurer, a navigator. He would explore the world and see this beauty for himself, and perhaps uncover even more beautiful places that no one had ever seen before. His parents, however, were not thrilled with this idea. His father, a merchant, urged his son not to pursue a life at sea. Being involved in the business firsthand, his father knew the dangers that a life on the sea could pose to a young man. He urged his son to study law instead, to settle down and live a comfortable, pleasant life in York. His father told him it was better to live a modest, secure life than to look for danger and excitement in distant places. Not wanting to disobey his father, Robinson stayed in York to study law for quite some time. But the more he studied, the fiercer his love of the sea and his dream of sailing became. Most days, he would sit in his lectures, staring out the window looking at the merchant ships making their way down the winding river toward the ocean. And then, who knew where the ships would be going? Would they sail south to Africa? Would they sail across to the Caribbean, where tropical islands awaited those brave enough to journey across the Atlantic? Those questions buzzed in his head as he watched the ships move on toward the horizon. Soon, it became clear that Crusoe could not stay in York and study law. His heart was pulling him in another direction. And it wasn't just temptation. It felt as though he was made to live a life on the sea. And so, Crusoe finally chose to disobey his father. With nothing but a few belongings on his back, Crusoe hopped on a ship with a friend. As they left the port, 
Crusoe looked over his hometown with a smile on his face. It was a good home that had served him well. But now? Now it was time to go. It was his first journey, his first time on the high seas, and it was a journey that would change his life forever in more ways than one. The first lesson he learned on that journey was that the sea was unforgiving. One night, a dark storm swept over the ship. The waves that had once been full of promise and excitement were now a tumultuous slurry of dark blue foam kicked up by the force of the waves, crashing against the boat. Everything happened so fast, but Crusoe had a bit of trouble even following it. The rain came down in a torrential pour, soaking the ship and everyone on board as they desperately tried to keep it afloat. And, though they tried hard, their efforts were futile. The storm caused the ship to wreck, and all the sailors splashed down into the cool water below. But, fortunately, there was land nearby. Using all his strength, Crusoe was able to swim and pull himself ashore. His friend, too, managed to survive. As they lay on the shore, catching their breath, his friend declared that he was going to go back home at once. But Crusoe didn't feel the same way. For the first time, he truly felt alive. In that instant, he knew that sailing was his purpose, that adventure was made for him. He felt the passion and adrenaline and excitement coursing through his veins, forcing away any fear before it had a chance to nestle inside him. Not even a shipwreck could take away the love Crusoe had for the ocean. Moreover, his dream was cemented even further. And then, the true adventure began. Crusoe set sail on another ship. As the ship pulled out of port, Crusoe looked around at the ocean in amazement. The sparkling sapphire water stretched for as far as the eye could see. It glistened in the bright sun, casting brilliant hues in the misty air as they continued on their way. There was nothing for miles. No islands, no land, just the beautiful and wild ocean full of potential and promise. Crusoe had never felt a love like this. He outstretched his hands in the mist of the boat as they carved their way through the waves. The mist invigorated him, reminding him even more that he was at home here. For the first half of the trip, Crusoe was pleased. The work wasn't easy, but just being on the sea made it worthwhile for him. In the mornings, he would rise before almost everyone else. He would step up on the deck and breathe in the sweet aroma of the waves reminding himself why this mattered so much to him. And at night, 
he would lie awake in his bunk as the stars sparkled overhead. He would close his eyes and listen to the waves as they gently lulled him to sleep. They brushed against the ship and swept out to the sea. It was a melody of timelessness and contentment. But the journey was not all fun and games for Crusoe, and once more he was faced with the reality of the danger that his line of work posed. While sailing near Morocco, the ship was taken over by pirates. Almost immediately, Crusoe was enslaved by pirates in the city-state of Salay, present-day Morocco. For two years, Crusoe was under the reign of his captors, working as hard as he could and dreaming of the sea. Night after night, nearly two years into his captivity, Crusoe managed to escape by boat. He sailed away from his captors in search of freedom once more, and he found it in a rather peculiar place. He came upon a Portuguese ship just off the west coast of Africa. Exhausted and sunburned, he was welcomed aboard by the captain, who revealed he was on his way to Brazil. That was music to Crusoe's ears. He had always dreamed of traveling across the Atlantic, but wasn't sure if that dream would ever become a reality. The journey he had been on only strengthened the deep love and respect he had for the sea, and so he joined the captain's crew and set sail for Brazil. The journey was long, full of days with nothing to do but look at the ocean in all of its glory. Crusoe spoke with the other sailors about their hopes for the future about the beauty of Brazil and the islands surrounding it. And when Crusoe finally saw the rocky, mountainous, beautiful coast of Brazil, he felt like he couldn't breathe. It was so stunning that it nearly brought tears to his eyes, a place his ancestors never could have seen a place that was full of adventure and ethereal beauty. Crusoe settled in Brazil for a bit and created a plantation in the hills. For some years, he enjoyed his peaceful life there, exploring the strange paradise and working on his plantation. But then, the call of adventure returned, and Crusoe joined an expedition headed for Africa. And as he sailed out onto the ocean, that familiar feeling of freedom and peace washed over him once more. Yet again, he was where he belonged out where the sky and the sea were picture-perfect mirrors of one another, back where the breeze smelled of salt and sand and the freshness of wide, open spaces. But, unfortunately for Crusoe and the rest of the crew, the ship would not make it to Africa. Off the coast of Venezuela, a storm descended upon the ship, wrecking it on the rocky shore of an island. Crusoe 
knew this accident was different than any of the others he had been in. There was a loss of hope in this accident. There was real chaos in it all. As soon as Crusoe landed in the water, he clung to some wreckage to keep himself afloat. Using the dim light available, Crusoe managed to get himself safely to shore. For a moment, he just lay in the sand on the shore. He thought back to all the times that he had had as a child dreamt of lying on the sand of distant tropical islands, back when that was a happy thought that lulled him to sleep each night, back when the danger of an adventure like this wasn't quite real. It soon became clear to Crusoe that he was the only survivor of the wreck. Aside from the captain's dog, and two cats who managed to make it ashore. He was alone on this island, far from anyone he knew, far from anyone that could help him. Crusoe nicknamed the island the Island of Despair, and for quite some time that was all that he felt. He longed to be back at his plantation, or back in England, where he could be secure and safe, where survival wasn't such a challenge. But, gradually, those feelings started to wane. Crusoe knew he could not be a prisoner to his fear and his despair. If he was going to survive here, he had to get to work. And so, he salvaged all that he could from the ship before it sank under the waves. He gathered weapons and tools to make forging a new life on the island more bearable. He wasn't sure how long he would be here, but he knew he had to make the most of it. First, Crusoe decided that he needed to make himself a shelter, a home where he could reside while he crafted a life for himself in this deserted place. He journeyed along the edge of the island as the sun rose high overhead, illuminating the landscape with a stunning orange glow. The shadows of the palm trees stretched far across the sand, offering cool places to get out of the sun and simply relax. Seeing the beauty of the island gradually made Crusoe more and more optimistic. It was a wild and stunning place, a place full of potential, even at a time like this. When he came across a small cave, he knew it would make a perfect home for the time being. It was just the right depth to fit him and his most prized belongings, protecting them from the sun, rain, and sand. He built a cross out of wood and marked it with the date of his arrival. September 30th, 1659. With each day that passed, he would put a mark on the cross. He quickly settled into the moss-coated cave, creating a small, cozy bed for himself from materials salvaged from the wreck, as well as plants and fronds found on the island. It was a far cry from his bedroom on the plantation, and his bedroom back in England. But it was his. In all this wilderness, he finally had something 
that was his. And he intended on protecting it in any way possible. One sunny afternoon, he chopped down a few trees. He hummed to himself as he did so, pleased that the work could distract him from any anxiety he was feeling. As he hummed, he couldn't help but notice the beautiful birds flying overhead. There were parrots of all sizes, shapes, and colors. They streaked the sky with brilliant reds, blues, greens, and yellows as they flit from branch to branch. And their song was sweeter than any other music on earth. Often, as he built the fence, he would sit down and simply listen to them. Their high-pitched melodies seemed to mix perfectly with the rhythm of the ocean waves lapping against the sandy shore. It was a symphony unlike any he had ever heard. It struck him, as he did this, that this was never something he would have noticed had he not arrived on the island. On the ships, the plantation, and back at home, he moved about the world with such urgency. There was hardly any time to linger and relax. Hardly any time to listen to the birds, to pay attention to the feeling of the wood under his fingertips as he crafted a fence from scratch. But now, he had all the time in the world. And he began to realize that he could reasonably use it. With his fence crafted to keep creatures out of his cave home, he continued for the next few days and weeks to make a life for himself on this so-called island of despair. Further inland one day, he stumbled upon a trip of goats. His heart leapt with joy. Now, he lived in such a way that just having something substantial to eat would fill him with immense gratitude. It was a strange feeling. A feeling that made him realize how much of life he was simply taking for granted before. He corralled the goats with the intention of grazing them for meat, and his plan worked perfectly. Some mornings, he would lead the goats to greener parts of the island. He would sit down in the warmth of the sun and watch the goats as they browsed and grazed, chatting with them and marveling at them. It was a gift from the heavens, he felt. They were part of his survival, and part of him maintaining his sanity. So much so, that he even took one of the goats as a pet, caring for it day in and day out, much like he would care for a house pet. After surveying the island, Crusoe realized that he had everything he needed to survive. The island was lush with fruits and vegetables and fertile soil. Soil he would even be able to grow wheat and barley in. Soil where he could sow a garden of his own. A garden that would sustain him for years and years to come. On a journey to the center of the island one day, Crusoe stumbled upon a valley teeming with beautiful plants and grapes. The grapes hung from their vines, ripe and heavy. As Crusoe plopped one in his mouth, he felt as though he could collapse into the grass. It was the sweetest thing he had ever tasted. 
This valley, surrounded by these grapes, felt like an oasis. He built himself a shady retreat there. A retreat that filled him with optimism. A retreat that almost felt luxurious. From then on, Crusoe spent most of his time trying to make life on the island more comfortable. He spent many days reading his Bible, growing closer to God. When he wasn't reading, he would try new ways to make this place feel like home. He tried to make candles, build himself a cellar, and even began to weave baskets from palms on the island and bake bread. Craving more companionship than the goat, dog, and cats could offer, Crusoe took it upon himself to train a pet parrot. He spent many afternoons watching the sunset with a dreamy look in his eyes as he tried to teach the parrot how to say his name. Simply hearing another being say his name filled a void inside him. For several years, Crusoe lived in peaceful isolation on the island. He had truly managed to carve out a beautiful life for himself there. He could have given up, could have turned to the darkness and embraced it. But instead, Crusoe discovered the value of peace and the beauty of nature. He discovered that though nature can be cruel and is entirely powerful, nature also provides everything that we need. Through his dozens of years on the island, Crusoe came to learn a lot. But his peaceful life on the island could not continue forever. One day, an English ship appeared on the horizon. Crusoe quickly learned that mutineers had taken control of the ship, planning to maroon the captain and his loyalists on the island. Seeing it as an opportunity to return home, Crusoe teamed up with the captain and his loyalists to retake the ship. Upon retaking the ship, Crusoe gave the mutineers two options. They could be taken back to England, where they would likely be hanged for their crime. Or they could stay on the island. The mutineers decided to stay on the island. Crusoe, kindly, gave them tips for surviving on the island, feeling a sense of duty to do so. And... On December 19th, 1686, Crusoe left the island behind. The island that had taught him so much about the world and himself. The island that had changed his life forever. The island that had reconnected him to nature and the important things in life. As he sailed toward England, he knew he was a changed man. But, deep down, there was one thing that would never be lost. His thirst for adventure, and his deep, insatiable love for the open sea. Now, he respected the power of the ocean even more. And, whatever adventures were going to come his way... He knew now he was ready for them more than ever. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.